I'd like to thank everybody for being here this weekend at Conspiracy Con in these strange and mysterious times in which we find ourselves in this country. I want to thank each and every one of you personally for coming to this event, for being with me now, because I believe that the times we're living in is the time for solutions, and I deal in solutions, and what I present to you today, I hope to give you some more tools, not only to know who's doing what to whom, but what we can do about it. The 20th century was the time for problem think. The 21st century is a time for solution think. I would like personally to thank uh, Victoria Jack and Brian Hall for inviting me and believing in this particular thesis because the uh, presentation that you're going to see tonight that I'll share with you is one of many things that I do. Um, but it's something I've believed in for a very long time. The presentation's title is called The Hidden Persuaders, The Subversive Use of Sacred Symbolism in the Media. And it is only part of what I do, but a very important part. If we turn to the slides, we can start very quickly because there's a lot to go through. This is, a, of course, a compressed version of a much larger study into symbolism in general. But we don't want to be doing some big, heavy academic analyses here. We just want to keep it very topical and give you an overview of what I consider to be a psychic dictatorship in our midst. I'm concerned about what it's doing to us all, but I'm specifically concerned with what it's doing to the young. And we'll address that as time goes by today. We're going to be talking about um, advertising and the hidden messages, the aesthetically conditioning motifs and politically conditioning motifs that come across in this very ubiquitous um, genre, this media. But many writers in the past have dealt with this, albeit they've left out the occult tradition. What you're going to be hearing today is a combination of two particular pieces of information, two studies, which have long been disconnected. In your own country, you've had Marshall McLuhan talk about the, you know, the powers of suggestion used by the media. You've had Vance Packard and Bran Wilson Key doing some fine work. Gene Kilborn, the activist, all authored people. And more recently, Dush Douglas Rushkoff doing wonderful work. And I started doing this work when I was 13 in Ireland. Long time interest in the occult, coming from many generations back, but also an interest in art, an interest in symbolism. And I didn't know that in my life there was going to be a convergence of these two realities. It took time. It didn't happen right away. It was only actually when I came across the work of Jordan Maxwell that suddenly I understood what I'd been seeing all the time, that this was more than just skulls and ice cubes. Because why would they be there? We have a connection between aesthetics, the portrayal in art, the portrayal in advertising, and an occult agenda. Very hard to accept for some, but we hope to prove the point tonight. The Western world in general, and America, is what I call symbol illiterate. What you're going to see tonight is a small window into a concept that I've taught for years, taught children especially, and it's just symbol literacy, which is learning about how the universal creator or the universal presence, the universal intelligence, speaks to us daily. It speaks in symbols, not words. It was so important for the hegemonic uh, authorities and patriarchal uh, bastions to get us off the track of dealing with symbol literacy that even in the uh, Bible, at the creation of Christianity, before thou shalt not kill, before that edict in the, in the Decalogue, you have this particular commandment, which is thou shalt not make for yourself a graven image or a symbol. It was more important to them than thou shalt not kill. And we're going to find out why. It has to do with the brain and moving us into what's called a left brain type of thought, a left brain type of cognition, a left brain type of expression, away from the right brain holotropic concept, which was more common to our forefathers. But thou shalt make no graven images. What, what are the ancient world covered in? What is Egypt covered in? It is graven images of God, graven images of divinity. It was absolutely natural to our forefathers to do so to portray divinity, to uh, portray the mysteries of being in symbolism. It became a very different edict in the Bible where it says, "Thou, sh you know, first came the Word. In the beginning was the Word. Well, I take exemption to that. I'm sorry. In f no, in the beginning does not come the Word of God. In the be beginning comes the image of God, or Goddess, if you want to be actually pedantic about it. But let's leave that aside for now. 
I work with the tarot and the divination, which uh, is the archive of knowledge, the Gnostic core of the great book of symbolism. The greater book of symbolism, the tarot, these are the main chapters. Anyone who wants to get symbol literate, because Mercia Eliad, Joseph Campbell, Carl Jung have gone blue in the face asking us to get symbol literate. They've become aware of how symbols are used because they take the soul up by being aware of how symbols work and art and imagination. We evolve spiritually. But that which can also help you evolve can also help you devolve, can also help you be enslaved. So the tarot and these great ancient um, Gnostic canon truths that were laid down by our forefathers were done mostly in symbols, the richness of symbolisms, and we teach this. In the occult tradition, it is essential that people become familiar with the role of symbolism and numbers and vibration and so on. One little aside, but connecting very much to what you've heard in other days here, is an interesting fact that what they call the Bible, let's say the Old Testament specifically, the five books of the Old Testament, the Pentateuch, are based on the Torah. They'll admit that. You ask anybody who's in the know, and they go, oh yes, we, of course we can accept that the Pentateuch originated with the Hebrew Torah. But what these people will die before they will admit, or tell you, is that the Torah originates from the Tarot. We haven't got time to explore this, but this is irrefutable if you do your homework and go to the reference works. In fact, it's the same word. The word is identical. But the difference is that the Bible and the Torah are communicated in words. Right? Words. The tarot communicates in symbols. And that's where the big problem is. Because you can argue till, you're, till the cows come home about a particular statement. Because now you have a language barrier and you have an interpretation barrier. Well, look, in symbolism, red is red. A sphinx is a sphinx. There's no argument about it. But when it comes to a written terminology, that's when the blood starts flowing. And that was the intention. In ancient medieval art, all the way down from the earliest times, we have um, symbols coming out of the occult world. We're finding them in the scriptures, finding them in religion. The crucifixion of Jesus, the crucifixion of St. Peter. The entire Bible can be decoded using aesthetic principles alone, or astrotheological motifs, cosmological motifs. The image on the right, for people who do not know, is one of the cards of the tarot, the hanged man. Well, didn't Jesus hang on a tree? Didn't Odin in the Scandinavian myths hang under a tree? Didn't Buddha get enlightened under a tree? Didn't Conan the Barbarian get crucified on a tree? I mean, we're seeing this motif all over the place. And science, which has always been doing catch-up anyway to what the mystics have been saying for aeons, but finally they're doing catch-up, and that's wonderful. They've just uh, found that, in fact, symbols are important because, as you see here, it says that there are 240,000 miles of neural threads in the human brain, enough to stretch from Earth to the moon, on every micrometer of these threads, there exists 250,000 units of information. But this data is recorded only as pictograms, only as composite images and not as words. That's right. The universal intelligence, our phylogenetic race memory of every experience that our forefathers have had is encoded in the brain, encoded in our DNA, in symbolism, in symbols, composite images. And today we find ourselves in a world replete with symbolism, images. We become indebted to it because it's so pervasive, in fact. We have the symbols of religion being denigrated by the corporate world. Powerful ancient symbols that we've associated with spiritual uplift are now being used for a different agenda. Jeremy Campbell in his fine book says, one important property of language is that while its symbols may be used to bring about physical results in the real world of substance, they need not be used for that purpose. Symbols can be decoupled from physical reality to a greater or lesser extent. Words are not deeds, though they often lead to deeds. Symbols can be manipulated to form new statements and expressions which are only tentative, playful, figurative. Symbols are at liberty to be a little irresponsible and experimental. Now that's a very loaded comment there. In 1835, we have the historian de Tocqueville in his review of America and in review of the genres that were going on of his time, wrote these words. He said, I fear that the productions of the democratic poets may often be surcharged with immense and incoherent imagery, with exaggerated descriptions and strange creations, 
and that the fantastic beings of their brain may sometimes make us re regret the world of reality. In 1835, you think that's old? Plato was doing the same thing in 300 BC when he warned about the artists, quote-unquote, this has been misinterpreted by many scholars, but he just said that the artists, quote-unquote, if they're given too much dominion over the mind, there will be a decline of civilization. I believe that he was aware even then of people who are still with us, still operating in our society today. Don't believe it? This is a quote. It says, I think we are destroying the minds of America, and that has been one of my lifelong ambitions. You can read for yourself who wrote that. They're happy to tell you what they're doing. Well, here's the results of their fine uh, work. Heroin and cocaine use among white youth climbed about 300% over the two decades before the 90s. For American, African-American youth, it jumped to a staggering 13 times the rate of 20 years before. Their frequency of eating disorders in teenage girls has skyrocketed. You're going to find out why. While any of these problems in isolation raises no eyebrows, taken as a group, they are barometers of a sea change, a new kind of toxicity seeping into and poisoning the very experience of childhood, signifying sweeping deficits and emotional competences. But the other side, they say, oh, kids love advertising. It's a gift. It's something they want. There's something to be said about being in there first, about branding children and owning them in that way. And in boys advertising antisocial behavior in pursuit of a product, that's a good thing. In 1990, compared to the previous two decades, the United States saw the highest juvenile arrest rate for violent crimes ever. Teen arrests for forcible rape had doubled. Teen murder rates quadrupled, mostly due to an increase in shootings. During the same two decades, the, that should be, suicide rate for teenagers tripled, as did the number of children under 14 who are murder victims. Douglas Rushkoff, in his book Media Virus, says children's television and MTV are, in fact, are the easiest places to launch countercultural missiles. The more harmless or inane the forum, the more unsuspecting the audience. I highlighted MTV there for an interesting point. One of the methodologies that these individuals use in their corporate logos is based on the phoneme system. If you say the word as a mantra to yourself, MTV, and say it quickly, MTV, MTV, empty TV, empty TV, empty TV, empty, empty TV. Ever seen any kids that watch MTV? They look pretty empty to me, wouldn't you say? Well, that's what they were being told. The great philosopher and theologian Erasmus said, the main hope of a nation lies in the proper education of its youth. The others are saying to the children, forget it. Questions are a burden, and answers a prison for oneself. Let us take control. Stop thinking. It's too much of a bother. We'll take care of you. So the experts are saying what is at stake is nothing less than the next generation, particularly males who in growing up are especially vulnerable to such disruptive forces as the devastating effects of divorce, poverty, and unemployment. The status of American children and families is as desperate as ever. We are depriving millions of children of their competence and moral character. Look at just the terminology there. We are depriving millions of children of their competence and moral character. Not they, but we. The Squire magazine said kids won't even find out how much their values have been perverted until they hit the high school. And Douglas Rushkoff says we have come to expect hidden messages in our kids' television. But this story of manipulation goes way back and has occult roots. Anyone who's done their homework knows that one of the um, groups that operate behind secret societies, it was the Fabian Society from Oxford University. It was founded by Sidney West, who again is very happy to tell you what they're doing. He says to play on those millions of minds, to watch them slowly respond to an unseen stimulus, to guide their aspirations without their knowledge. All this, whether in high capacities or in humble, is a big and endless game of chess with ever extraordinary excitement. Well, we got them. They're called the media, but they've been around longer than television because the word, in fact, if you study it, goes back to Medes and to a place in the Middle East, in the Middle East not far from where Libya is now, called Medea. And in Medea were the sorcerers and the astrologers, 
not necessarily negative people, but a tribe, a very adept cult from the ancient world who specialized in the use of talismans, amulets, mantras, and sorcery. And the kings of the world knew that if battle hadn't worked, or if legal means hadn't worked to get rid of an enemy, or you didn't want to be known that you were getting rid of your enemy, you simply called on the Medes. And you bring the representative of the media in to your court, and he'll take care of the problem, because he's going to put the spell on your enemy, the, e the hex, because they know how to do it. And that's where we get the word Mediterranean mediation, meditation, meditation, and medication, the medics. Study this alone, and a whole interesting subject will eat, eat, open itself up. Because we still have, you see, the sorcerers and the voodoo and the witch doctrine. We still have it. Only it's now te the techno shamanism. It's the silicon sorcerers. It's the ivory tower witch doctors. And they're still very busy at what they're doing up on Madison Avenue and behind the other great corporate giants who are only too happy to tell you what to think. Not how to think, but what to think. Ursula Franklin, she says, I picture the reality in which we live in terms of military occupation. We are occupied in the way that the French and the Norwegians were occupied by the Nazis during World War II, but this time by an army of marketeers. We have to reclaim our country from those who occupy it on behalf of their global masters. Interesting terms there, interesting phraseology. Well, these individuals, they do go back a long way. And they have understood completely your psyche. They've had generations, centuries to study it. Their type of sorcery involves different kinds of techniques. But it's still the same effect. Telehypnosis, metacontrast, hemisync, synesthesia, embedding. New names, new terms, but for a very old, well-known practice. To get you into groupthink, into subservience. To get you to embody dialectical divisions of which there is no end in our society. To fashion your allegiances for you to implant associations that your mind might not normally uh, associate, to purvey uh, escapism, rampant escapism, and projection of fantasy into reality, to inflate false personas so that you don't have to be you, you can live it out through the person on the screen, and the excessive eroticization, especially in regards of the female. What we're talking about today has enormous consequences for the women of the planet to find their power again. But just one point, just that little... Um, Anecdote there, we talked about the endless dialectical divisions. Are you aware of how many there are? And that they're crafted based on a very set agenda to pose one party or one group against the, the rest. We could explore that alone. We could do a whole seminar on just that one thing alone of the dialectical divisions that are created in our society. And there are many even in the intellectual academic world, in the function of our own senses, in the function of our own biology. And uh, the two that we'll only be able to really touch on today is actually the last ones, liminal or subliminal. We'll be trying to focus more on that. But as I said, this is a very deep subject. We don't have time to go into anything more than an overview. And we, I would love to get into the whole concept of the lost language of symbolism and do a deeper work on this subject. Uh, but that time will have to come. Right now we just have to keep it very topical and accessible. Not only do we have those divisions, but we've got a very, very important tripartite uh, division that these media sorcerers use on us. It is the simple division between the three kinds of intelligence that we have. Most people think only in terms of mental intelligence. No. We should know that there is also body intelligence. Your body is an intelligent, vibrant, living thing. Completely self-contained intelligence there, cellularly. The mind, of course, we're familiar with overstated in our culture to an unbelievable degree. But then there's the heart, the intelligence of the heart. And they know how to send signals and coded messages to each of those kinds of intelligence. When you think they're talking to one, actually they're talking to another. And vice versa. So it's kind of hard to track it. It takes symbol literacy to know what they're doing. Who is the enemy? What tools are they using? They're happy to stimulate you in various ways. They're happy to take things away from you down through the centuries for thousands of years and then replace it with things you don't need. They're happy to make those associations for you that we see on billboards every day. Well, did I give them permission to do that? Did I want to see their artwork uh, facing me or on the sides of buses? I didn't give them permission to talk to me, did I? But they're doing it. Somebody has taken a right off of me. 
So they're busy telling us what I'll get from them. Things I don't need. Everything. Convenient, smarter, faster, happier. Is that right? But they don't tell you the side effects, do they? They don't tell you about the disassociation, the dysfunctionality, the kids, the teens who are jaded, addicted, bipolar, suicidal, delinquent, sociopathic, institutionalized, possessed. You're literally climbing over people. They used to call it possession in the old days, you know, when the Medes took care of you or the local uh, witch doctor uh, did the, his piece on you. They used to call you possessed. Well, we are still possessed today. Actually, if you ask any churchman, they'll tell you that the rate of possession has gone up since the advent of the television. Oh, yeah. The whole theme of this uh, talk is about how we are going to get symbol literacy so we can graduate and evolve spiritually. Because as Nietzsche c clearly pointed out, we have the misfortune or the fortune, who knows which, of being the only creature who must constantly overcome himself in order to live fully. So there is a drag factor. There's individuals who absolutely are bent double, working overtime to make sure that we do not evolve and that our children regress, that civilizations are in retrograde. What would happen if a pharaoh came back today? And some of the techniques that they use in this psychic dictatorship are words, symbols, colors, rhythms, light, movement, mudras, which means hand positions, gestures, which have been used for aeons as means of spiritualization, used by cults, infused with mysticism, are now being used on us for quite an opposite agenda. To drag us down into the pits of our own miasma, our own hells. As Carl Jung said, consciousness is a recent acquisition of nature. It is still in an experimental state, so to speak. It is frail, menaced by specific dangers and easily injured. As anthropologists have noted, one of the most common mental derangements that occur among primitive people is what they call the loss of a soul. Take this what comment that he's talking about and transpose it to our societies today. That is exactly what is happening. The loss of soul. How is this technique done? What is going on? How are they um, doing this to us? You've heard the story of the zombie, right, in Haiti? Well, the zombie was a person just like you or I, and they slipped something into his drink. And that is the uh, resin or the uh, potion or the liquid or whatever you want to call it, the solution from the detura plant. Now, if you drink that, you become kind of zombified, but the next day you kind of be back to normal. So every day, you see, the witch doctor had to continually administer the detura plant poison, otherwise you, it wouldn't work. Well, we have the same thing today. Not only it's called TV, it's called the media. Every day, the steady diet of pre-digested mumbo-jumbo. And it really reminded me of this wonderful um, movie called The Devil Rides Out, in which the satanic characters, and, and he's busy hypnotizing somebody. He says that your will is leaving you, slipping away, and you are beneath my influence. Though your eyes are open and you seem aware, you are in fact asleep. Your faculties dormant, your ability to act and think subservient to my will. That is the agenda. The consequence on the grassroots level is that we are running around shopping malls, uh, busy spending and buying and, and being busy with all of that. Six hours, a week, six hours a week, the average person spends shopping as opposed to 40 minutes a week with their children. And then we wonder why we got problems. Research has shown that in the first few milliseconds of your perceiving something, we do not only unconsciously comprehend what it is, but we decide whether or not we like it. The cognitive unconscious presents our awareness with not just the identity of what we see, but an opinion about it. Our emotions have a mind of their own, one which can hold views quite independently of your rational mind. And the demographics have changed in, since even the 50s of how much change there's been by the advent of the media. The word consumer actually comes from consumption, and it didn't mean anything good. It actually meant to pillage, to desecrate, destroy. And in, if you know, consumption was the term that was used when you had tuberculosis, when you couldn't breathe, when you had no life force. The consumer. Well, before we get to how they're doing it, we've got to say who is doing it. So a little recap on the fact of other things that you've heard here is that there is an occult history of America. And these are the individuals who have always used symbolism coming out of the ancient world, as Jordan and others have shown. 
The man on the left is Adam Weishaupt, who was the head of the Illuminati, whose um, origin date was uh, May 1st, 1776, quite close to July 4th, 1776, the founding of America. His mantle passed to Giuseppe Manzini, who then, when he passed away, the mantle of the Illuminati passed to the man on the right, who is called Albert Pike. Everyone in this room should be familiar with who this man is and what he is about, because he brought what is called Scottish Rite Freemasonry system to this country. Scottish Rite Freemasonry. And the symbols on the dollar bill are the hallmarks of this order, this secret society that George Washington and other of your founding fathers were warning about. If you go to the memoirs and read it, they were Freemasons. But Freemasonry was a positive, basically philanthropic society at that time and was infused by these negative elements from Bavaria and from the old world of Europe. And they warned against it. In fact, the Duke of Brunswick, the head of Grand World Freemasonry, had stood up in the 17th century and asked for the disbanding of World Freemasonry completely because he was aware that it had been infused with negative elements of a luminist philosophy. And George Washington and others in this country did likewise. Unfortunately, nothing happened. And the Illuminati were able to infiltrate this um, societies of Freemasons. And they're still operating today. And this has a bearing on what we'll be talking about. Here is a proof, of course, just for anyone who doesn't know, that the founding fathers definitely were involved in Freemasonry. You'll notice that the, uh, on the uh, Washington uh, bust there, it says, Freemason and First President. Now let's read that again. Freemason and First President. Not the other way around. Thank you. Aha, uh aha. -huh, uh -huh. Important detail. To go into masonry, endless story. Can't do it. Haven't got the time. But the point is, just the word alone, just my innocent fascination with words, and terms that these individuals use. M-A-S-O-N. If you actually draw a hexagram on the pyramid, you will find that that actually inscribes. It's been in front of you for many, 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 cent for many, many generations, but you don't notice it. Remember Edgar Allan Poe? You want to hide something? You put it in plain view. Jordan Maxwell talked about the scorpion sting, the double scorpionic sting, remember, of the tail? Remember that? Look at the uh, prongs of the um, banner there and ask yourself something about symbolism. These people have never hidden who they are, so we're not talking like uh, Ken Thomas was saying, forget a conspiracy theory, it's all conspiracy, no theory. <laughs> Here you have it, at the G8 summit, G8 summit, summit, peak summit, you have all these uh, fine fellows sitting around at a, a round table, which is, of course, coming from the Celtic mythologies of Arthurian legends, with a pyramid in the middle. Here is uh, Mitterrand of France, Bill Clinton of America, Blair, a bunch of other criminals. I'm not aware of who they are. <laughs> and here's Larry, Moe, and Curly. <laughs> you think they're all from different parties? Think again. Simple dialectics. They're all in the same gang. I'm preaching to the choir here, so we'll not spend too much time on that. But you see, what we have to understand is that the girl next door gets involved too, or what they put before you as the girl next door, are people who often have, as Arizona Wilder will only be too happy to tell you, long associations with fraternities and secret orders. Again, the pervasiveness of occultism right in the face of people if they only know where to look. The tarot cards, nothing negative about tarot cards, nothing negative about the occult, but they're using it. In the cards, in the tarot deck, the major arcana, card number four is what we call the emperor. It shows a king sitting in a marble throne with a stern countenance. Now, wait a minute. If you go to Washington, D.C. and look at the Lincoln Memorial, what do you see there? Most statues of presidents are standing, aren't they? Or they're a bust. Isn't there something peculiar about that symbol? Where do you think they got it? It came from the tarot. It has occult origins, the very symbol of the Lincoln Memorial, of the great uh, president sitting in the chair with that type of countenance, it has an origin in the occult. One of the symbols that should be well known, pretty generically known, is the famous handshake of the craft uh, members. And in corporate logos, you'll see this constantly. I can only share with you a very small amount of the work that I've been doing since I was 13, but I'm sure that the point will be made that when you look at these ad copy again or billboards, you'll start to see these associations and understand more what they are. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't know how that one got in. <laughs> Anyway, um, the Masons refer to their own uh, procedures 
their own um, teachings as the craft. If you get into studying the um, Jordan Maxwell has labored for years to discover the occult roots of government, big business, you know, and religion. Big business, yes. Even the big businesses, they're not the rags to riches tales that have been put in front of you uh, where individuals make their money on the white market. The white market makes up a very small amount of the money that's in the world. That starts studying the black market, not as has been put before you, uh, a bunch of uh, dr drug dealing gangsters on the side of the streets. That's not the black market I'm talking about. It's the occult underworld where the main trading and wheeling and dealing of the world is done, where you can get anything for any price. Well, when we look into that, we'll find that there is again, occult origins, and behind these big businesses, the franchises, the corporations, hopefully we can prove a little bit today that there is an occult origin. You've seen the pyramid, and a pyramid basically has three sides. Because the number three is very important in Freemasonry. Very important. In fact, if we look at it, we find that the number three is sacred, and it is the reason why it has been incorporated into so many areas of religious and secular life. We have the economic world with its first, second, and third worlds. Uh, we didn't create that, but yet there's the terms. We have the main political parties. We have social classes calling us upper, middle, and lower. Well, I didn't think of myself as anything like that, but here we are. We have these terms made for us by social critics, soci sociologists. We have the competence levels in sports. We've got the levels of matriculation. We've got the branches of government, the legislator, the armed forces even, and the courts. Three divisions, always three it's a very important number to look out for. In your Senate, there's three tiers high. The emphasis on the number three. The word threshold. The Masons talk about the entrance to all temples, cathedrals, and churches being called a threshold. That means thrice hold. One of their gods is called the thrice great Hermes. It's an old story. It goes back to the Druids and ancient civilizations where they also divided their priestarchies into three distinct groups. That's why on the flags of the world, you'll find the tripartite, the tricolor. So many flags of the world have the tripart telling you who owns them, who's running. And again, in our modern ambiance, you find symbols of societies and orders using the double triangle, the 33, and the symbol of the uh, serpent, which if anyone's familiar with my work on Atlantis, the serpent comes in very strongly there. Okay, the double triangle of the 33rd. Again, they're not even hiding things here. ABC Towers, by the way, in uh, Los Angeles is two triangles, two large triangles. And symbols in America. Right, let's take it to the context now, coming more to the particular in your own country. The symbol of the eagle has been explored and how the eagle then turns up on lots of corporate logos. It actually has to do with the fact that the eagle is the old symbol for Scorpio. Long before Scorpio got a scorpion as its symbol, it was ro the symbol was the eagle, Aquila it's called. And if you look at an old planisphere, you'll see it. It's a gigantic constellation in the sign of Scorpio. And that is why the Romans used the symbol of the eagle. That is why the Vatican used it. That is why the Nazis ended up using it. And that's why it's in America. Because the same gang are running the show and they use the same symbols. It has uh, not got to do with the fact that it's the bald eagle, the indigenous symbol of whatever, no. It has to do with the fact of the sign of Scorpio, which any competent astrologer will tell you rules power and money. The sign of Scorpio. Uh, again, a, a very elaborate study in itself. We don't have time to go into it. We're looking for corporate logos. We're looking for geometry. You don't have to look very far. And the connection to the occult. The Pentagon, and that shape is suggestive of many things, actually was designed by a high priest in the Ordo Templi Orientis. That's a secret society from Germany and who was a very close friend of uh, L. Ron Hubbard. There's a big connection between John Whiteside Parsons, who was an advisor to the military, who was also involved in a very high-level secret society called the OTO. Another great book um, by David Overson, The Secret Architecture of Our Nation's Capital, proves that symbolism was used in even the design of the cities of America, including Washington, D.C. He says that there are 22 zodiacs secreted into the architecture of Washington, D.C. 22 and hundreds of other astrological symbols. But 22 zodiacs secreted into the architecture of Washington, D.C.? Uh, there's only four in London. If you go around London, there's four. But there's 22 in your own capital city. The whole thing being based on geometry and symbolism. When you wanted to write the word Sirius in Egyptian, 
You did it with the hieroglyphic that's on the bottom right. It was an obelisk, a star, and an oval. Okay? That was how you drew the, the name Sirius in Egyptian. What do you have in Washington, D.C., in stone, is exactly that. The Oval Office, the Pentagon, and the obelisk. Why would they want to do that? What on earth has Sirius and star systems far away got to do with Washington and America's destiny? Why are any stars on any flags anywhere? The laying of the capstone, the laying of the monuments, the whole design was based on Freemasonry. If you don't believe it, there is the proof because there is the symbol of Freemasonry on the block that they're laying. Okay, right there is a symbol that is known in Freemasonry. That symbol that I showed you is referred to as the compass and the rule. A wonderful study in itself, and the letter G in, in the middle. But we don't have time to go into the occult history of these things. I just want to show you how it turns up in logos and corporations. Here you find the exact same symbols of the mallet, the Masonic hammer, and the rule, the compass, and the key. The key is very important because it relates to Vatican intelligence. It re relates to secret societies coming out of uh, Italy, and your governor, Al Cecchi, when he ran for governor, he used a very in distinctive key as his logo. And in Seattle, you have what's called the Key Bank. The Key Bank. And the Florida Keys and so on. That symbol of the compass turns up in the car, car company, Acura. That funny looking A is their symbol. If you actually look at it properly, you'll find that it is a Masonic compass. I've always said in the writings that I've done on this subject that over 70% of the things that you buy, the products that you buy, have names that don't mean anything in English. Don't believe me? Go to your Safeway, go to any of these stores, and just observe that one day. Of how many symbols and products don't have a name that means anything in English. Now, you'd think that the merchant would want to sell his wares as quickly as he could, right? But we're not talking about the merchant here. We're talking about the designers that he goes to in order to get a logo or get a, you know, a design made. We're talking about those individuals and not necessarily the merchants. So I'm not talking about this coming from the merchant world. They don't know anything. They just want to sell or you know, open a motel and whatever else they want to do. This does not originate from them. But Acura, what does that word mean? We also find that in Freemasonry, you have the color blue that is very important because the first opening degrees of Freemasonry are called the blue and red degrees. That's why you have red light districts and blue movies. Oh yeah, let's find out what's been going on here. But you also have this strange uh, fixation with the color blue turning up a lot. And you find it heavily in the corporate world. You find it in government, but you also find it in corporate world. Just that alone, just take one little piece. Just look at color. Open your aesthetic eyes and look at how color is being used in our society. Because color is very important to spiritual uplift and how color and vibration are used. You find it in the context of America, the dollar bill or money. This symbol, by the way, is um, well known, of course, but it actually... is the word Isis, the goddess of the moon, you know, concertina together in a designer fashion. That's what it is, because this is not a symbol that's new, by the way. This symbol goes back many hundreds of, no, 20 or so thousand years into Egypt. This symbol that you have for money, of the great S of the serpent and the two rods, representing the goddess Isis, who is the goddess of the moon. That's why coins are silver, gold, and bronze, representing the sun, the moon, and the earth. Just like the medals that you get at the Olympic Games, there's a reason why they have those colors and why money is only in three colors. The sun, the moon, and the earth. Another Masonic um, motif is what they call the floor of the house. It's basically a checkerboard. You can go into any Freemasonic lodge and you'll see it, the checkerboard. There's George Washington standing on it. It's one of their seminal motifs. It's also why you see it on the hats of the police. They're literally, and they wear blue, don't they? The blue robes. And the checkerboard is found on the hats of the police because they're just officiating for the system, for these fraternities. Don't believe it? Here's the Los Angeles Times. Uh, do you remember the FBI uh, investigations, federal investigations into the corruption in Los Angeles? It's still ongoing, but started a few years ago. Let's just observe this little article that I found. Uh, I think it was Jordan, you picked this up. Um, Two sergeants are among those to be charged in alleged planting of a gun to frame a suspect, sources say. More charges are possible. These three uh, policemen had, you know, interned themselves in a house and were not giving themselves up. 
But let's look what ha is said here. According to one source, district attorney officials do not plan to give the three an opportunity to surrender themselves to authorities today. All right, no, so no leniency for the three cops who are, who are the bad guys. They're going to be arrested, the source said. They're not part of the brotherhood. They're not part of any fraternity. They're going to be arrested like anybody else. I didn't write it. Checkerboards, rock groups, strange imagery. It's been pointed out by the people in the know. Let's just take this one for a moment. Um, I'm not making any comment about the Beatles. Let's leave that aside. But just the imagery. Let's, let's study with educated eyes the symbolism. This is a procession to a funeral. John Lennon is God. He's wearing white. Ringo Starr is the sexton or the presiding priest who dresses in the black cassock. The grave digger with, uh, sorry, the actual corpse is uh, Paul McCartney. That's why he has bare feet and a suit, his best suit you get buried in, you know what I mean? And the grave digger, he's in jeans and jacket, is George Harrison, walking on Abbey, Abbey Road on a black and white checkerboard. Checkerboards, Chevrolet, corporations using the checkerboard. Would that sell you on anything? Why would they choose that logo? So there we have it. They are the chess masters, as Sidney Webb uh, pointed out. And that's how they consider us. They consider, as he is saying, that it's just a game. It's just a game. So we need to know the rules, don't we, if we want to play the game with them. The double cross that you see here, you see the knight wearing the cross of Lorraine, what's called the cross of Lorraine, on the checkerboard. And you see that Exxon are also using that double cross. And many other corporations use it. I've had to edit this a lot. So you'll see this double cross a lot. It's uh, from the province in France called Lorraine. Um, and it's also called the Knights of Malta Cross. You might be interested to know that uh, Martin Luther King, who was shot in Memphis, was killed in what they called the Lorraine Motel. They leave tracks for those who know. The double cross. But one of the all-time most pervasive symbols is, uh, of Freemasonry and, and the Templars is the cross and the crown. They like it because it signifies the means of operation, their modus operandi of how they've gained their power through the two forces of religion and monarchy. State, you see, and religion. The cross and the crown, or crown and gown, as we call it over in England. Two forms of, of slavery. Here on California State, in Hayward, they're, um, they're um, magazine here, you'll find it replete with double crosses and pyramids and Masonic symbols, a globe and so on. Here is the Knights of Malta cross of the Knights of Columbus being used and you'll find that is an ancient symbol going back to uh, uh, Samaria here. You see that? And this is Celtic from the Picts in Scotland. You'll see the, the Malta cross, what's now being used as the Malta cross, has very, very ancient ancestry as does the swastika and the serpent. Many, many thousands of years old. Turning up in all sorts of weird places. Wait a minute, first it was the ancient Picts of Scotland and now we find it on the flag of the Nazis. Here it is, the Knights of Malta Cross and the three oak leaves, remember the number three being important? The Knights of Malta Cross. There we find it on the uh, crown of the Queen of England. So what's the connection between the British royal family and the Nazi party? I don't know. Maybe we should look into that. You find the red cross or the, again, the cross on lots of areas. This flag on the left is the flag of the sovereign military order of Malta. But you find a very similar motif on, on Switzerland and for the red cross and in other areas as well. Oh, what's this then? Anybody open a book on the Templars, you know, the Crusades, and you'll find that they wore the white with the red cross. And here you have a serpent eating a man. A very old motif, by the way. So let's just again emphasize that what is old turns up in the new because the connections between what is going on in our society and its history many thousands of years ago is of seminal importance in all of this. To understand the times that we're in, we have to look to origins as well.
and look at the symbols and how they're being used. Here's a drink, the, a company, a chemical called Sobe. But Sobe is a play on words. It's an Egyptian word to do with the god of the underworld, Sobek, the, the crocodile-headed god of the underworld that represented the lower appetites. A word that doesn't mean anything in English, Sobe. Here we have the Knights of Malta Cross, the red cross on Xilinx Corporation. Who is running them? And the strange name, Xilinx, where did that come from? We have the symbol of the Knights of Malta Cross. It was also called the Black Sun. And we have it turning up on the Arco symbol, which is again the same image of the Knights of Malta Cross, just turned a little bit to the side. And the word Arco, again, means nothing in English. And it doesn't stand for Atlantic Richfield uh, Company and all of that. What it is is a Latin word. It comes from the word Archon. If you add an N to the end of it, it's, it comes from the word Archon, which means fallen angel. Arco means fallen angel. If you are familiar with my work on Atlantis, that will mean something to you, those who've read that book. Another one of the symbols is the dove. How holy, how wonderful. Well, it's not Christian. It's another symbol of secret societies because in Spanish and in, in, in Italian, the word for dove is columb, right? That's why it's the Knights of Columbus symbol. The Knights of Columbus or the Knights of the Columb use the dove as their symbol. Anybody get out the uh, James Bond movie, um, I think it's for your eyes only, one of the terrorists there, one of the assassins, is called the dove and he wears the symbol. Yeah, you'll find this. And you find the symbol of the dove on the maces of the Queen of England. And that's where you get District of Columbia, Columbia Records, pictures, um, British Columbia, Christopher Columbus. Where do all the drugs come from? Happen to be just from Columbia. Why? Because there's somebody called the Knights of Columbus, Columbus purveying them from that place and only too happy to let you know that they're doing it. And you may have heard about a place called Columbine High School, the place of the doves. Ah, well, anyone who's done their occult homework knows that the Cagliostro's Egyptian rite, one of the great occultists from the ancient world, was called Cagliostro. He invented a Masonic rite called the Egyptian rite. And you need to know about this because it said it involves a virginal boy or girl as an oracle or even priest. These virgins were known in Masonic circles as the columns, the doves. They were sacrificial. Columbine High School. We've heard a lot about it, but we haven't heard about the ritual side of it too much, connecting to these old Masonic rituals. The owl is a symbol of the Bohemian society, but it goes way back to the cult of Minerva and Lilith, the goddess Lilith. And the owl is on the dollar bill. Hidden away in the right corner of the, of the dollar bill is the symbol of the owl, because it goes back again to ancient secret societies. One of their symbols is the Tudor rose, The rose is a hallmark of secret societies. Nothing evil with a rose, it's just who's using it and what for. You'll find it copiously used in the imagery of the Grateful Dead. Bob Weir of the Grateful Dead is a member of the Bohemian Society. You'll find it on uh, corporations that have long ancestry. And on tech companies, dot com companies, you'll see the use of the red rose and you'd wonder why the association. Here it is, uh, a corporate um, ad for Viagra. An interesting word that, if you get into it, it actually means the blood royal, or it means the, ro the river of blood, because that's your libido. They're giving you this product to raise your libido and using words that mean that. We have all of the different cosmetic companies here around the symbol of a, a flower. See that? These are all the famous companies indicating to you that they come from one source. The number 322 is important in occult circles because it's the large number of the Skull and Bones Society from Yale University. Uh, why they use it is, uh, there's many interpretations depending on who you are. Since these people are so involved in symbolism of astrology, not the astrology that's put before us today commonly, but a different kind of astrology, this relates to actually the spring equinox, okay, which is 321, May, March. 21st and 22nd, when the sun, which is their great symbol, rises on the eastern horizon on March 22nd. That's one of the reasons why they use that. And the skull comes because these individuals were originally part of the pirates, what are known as the pirates, or the men of fire, who were sent out by the agents of the British royal family to colonize America. They weren't just a bunch of swashbucklers like you've seen in the movies. No, these were agents who were sent under the high seas to colonize 
the countries like America and to annihilate through disease and war anybody that stood in their way. And they did a good job. And their ancestors then opened the Skull and Bones fraternities and the other occult fraternities that are here for the education of their own children. And they even call themselves the Men of Fire or the Pirates, Pyra, and have the Skull and Bones symbol, which is the pirate symbol, because that's how they came here. And the number 322 is used if you look at the movie um, Enemy of the State when they, the uh, protagonist looks at his watch as the feds are busting in at the end of the movie when Gene Hackman and the, the main protagonist are trying to leave he looks at his watch and you'll see the letters 322 in James Bond movies you'll see this if you're looking you'll see that number used a lot and here in Nike you see in the flames this is a Nike logo don't ask me what it means but <laughs> you'll see this is just one example I have to be brief but there's many examples of this all of these pirate families these pirate families became fabulously wealthy because from day one they were purveying opium, they were purveying alcohol, and they were purveying uh, other things, slavery. They were involved in slavery when they colonized America and these other countries. And some of them, these families went on to become fabulously wealthy and are still known today. But as I said, they're not the rags, the riches companies. Seagrams and all of these groups have a long ancestry in Bushmills. And one of them is the Bacardi group, right? Well, they are descended from these types that I'm telling you about. Here is their headquarters in Porto in Portugal those flames are 10 feet high and in the middle of there is the logo of the vampire bat with blood dripping down from it so I don't know what it tells you about a corporate uh, headquarters that has flames and 10 foot high with a blood uh, soaked vampire bat for the logo but you can guess what their consciousness is like and the stream of dead bodies that they've left behind with their poison that they've been disseminating for generations and here in the corporate logos, again, suggestion. They're telling you, they're suggesting to you that these companies that are famous come from the pirates. They do it in a designer way so you don't catch it. But if you know what is going on here and the symbols that are being used, they'll be too happy to tell you about the sun and who they are and the pyramid and the fact that they ha where they have got their money and what they've been into and who they've been denigrating. One of the ancient symbols of uh, these societies is the claw. I bring this up because uh, you see a lot of motifs that look like corporate logos. You know, these are pretty much, you see these generically on banks, right? Look again. Do you see how that is a claw of a tiger or a bear? Because that's what it is. Uh, there's ancient societies called the African Order of the Tiger, of which Federal, your FDR, Roosevelt, was a member of an order called the Ancient Order, the African Order of the Tiger. And their symbol was the claw marks. And you'll often see a claw like that surrounding the earth. Because these secret societies believe that that's what they're doing. That they are, in fact, uh, gripping the earth. Owning the earth. 666, everybody's into it. Can't spend too much time on it, but there's a lot of symbolism in the, in the whole concept of the 666. The three sixes being used in corporate design. Here's the old company gateway before they changed it to a black and white cube. They used to use the three intertwined sixes. And talk about gateways. But in the time remaining, I want to share with you some more of the connections between the corporate logos and astrology. And Frederick Nietzsche summed it up. He said, as long as you still experience the stars as something above your head, you will lack the eye of knowledge and never know wisdom. And was he right? Because stars are everywhere. They're on everything. The zodiac is one of the archives that the designers and the media giants go to. Their designers know to go to the realm of Sabianism and talismans and, and magic and to astrology to look for and to alchemy. They look to the esoteric in order to have um, to be in business. Although this is a carefully guarded secret. And talking about the zodiac, the Bible says that God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens to divide the day from the night and let them be for signs and for seasons for days and for years let them be for signs the signs of the zodiac have an ancient history the zodiac is where we get a lot of these symbols because the 12 signs that you're familiar with the 12 generic signs of the zodiac there are actually 88 constellations altogether around the ecliptic 88 symbols you don't know about those but the advertising people do they research them they're not going to use the ones that you're familiar with because then we catch on wouldn't we so they use the other ones or they'll tweak or change things around. I'm going to give you some examples of how they do that. 
But cities, as I said, were based on zodiacs. Here's Paris, divided into the 12 divisions, coming to the central arch with a phallic symbol in the middle. From the heavens, you have the constellations. <laughs> They're not physically up there, it's just observation. But from there came the great symbols of the lion, for instance, and the crab uh, from the night sky. The first theater of mankind was the night sky, which he could draw the pictures of his mind. And lots of these logos, lots of these symbols that we recognize as astrological symbols, nothing negative in them, but then they turn up in the corporate world, as we'll see in a minute. Stars on flags all over the place. One of them, if you're into this, by the way, if you have a plan to go on and do any of your own marketing in any field, it's very important to know what they do because what they do, you can also do. You can take your power back and use the same motifs, but use it for uh, positive reasons, proactive reasons. Know, just very basically, that in astrology, there are four signs, fire, water, air, and earth, but the corporate people mostly use the fire signs and the earth signs because fire has to do with energy and libido and will to power, and earth signs have to do with money, materialism, and ownership and assets. So just even using astrology as a, what you call, a hermeneutic of, of understanding how corporate logos are used is very important. And then you can start using it based on your own chart, for instance, or the message that you're trying to get across. Using the four elements is a very handy way of doing it because it involves colors and different other kinds of techniques that you can use. Here's a good example of how stars play a role. This is considered the bear which is the generic uh, grizzly of America, of California. No, it's not where the symbol comes from because the red star in the corner gives it away. The bear that they're talking about here is Ursa Major, the bear, up there. And the star is the pole star that the bear turns around. So what you have there is an astrotheological motif disguised in another way. Very, very well disguised, as a matter of fact. For years, down f through the centuries, the bearer, the seven stars, were called the Magnificent Seven, or the Shining Seven. The seven planets, even, if you want to look at it. The seven planets in the heaven, the seven lights, which we find turning up as archetypes and stereotypes everywhere. Just observing how much the simple symbol of the sky is used in corporate logos as a backdrop is very important. The sky. Here's the symbol for Leo, astrological symbol for Leo. This is the astrological symbol for Virgo, the sun moving into the constellation of the Virgin, Virgo, is where you get the Columbia Pictures symbol from. This is the ancient symbol of Cancer, the white horse, before the crab. Anybody here a Cancer? The star sign? Yes, yeah, some of you? Right. Well, before you were given the symbol of the crab, your ancient symbol was the white horse or the unicorn. That's why you see on Royal Heraldry that symbol. So the white horse is the symbol of Cancer, and so when you see the sun, behind the horse of Tristar, it just represents the sun in Cancer. It's an astrological motif. And the Virgin is Virgo with the 12 stars in her hair, or the crown of 12 stars, the zodiac. And the winged horse, as you see on heraldry here, represented Leo and Cancer. The constellations in the northern sky, right beside each other, the house of the moon, Cancer, and the house of the sun. This is again based on astrology and the winged horse being connected with Cancer. In Merrill Lynch, you have the symbol of the bull, which obviously is very clear, relates to Taurus, which is an earth sign. You see how earth signs, Taurus, represents money, ownership, um, finances. So you have a financial company here using an astrological symbol because they know what it means. Sagittarius. Anybody here a Sagittarius? Star sign Sagittarius, yeah. Your symbol is used as the a horseman, right? With the, the bow and arrow. Here you find it. Look at the solar symbol on the bottle. It's already made like the sun. Because Sagittarius is a fire sign. Anyone who's a Sagittarius knows that they're a fire sign. Here's the lady with a bow. One of the, the latest Cadillac advertisements, literally on television, showed a, a person firing an arrow down a street and then came the car. Using the bow and arrow motif, you'll see it a lot. It relates to the sign of Sagittarius. What I'm talking about is not the normal astrology. They're using different kinds of associations. <clears throat> the corporation Safeway relates to the sign of cancer also because anyone who knows astrology knows that the sign of cancer has to do with safety, security in the home, and food, mother, and nurturement. So the safe way, right? And the yin-yang of uh, the cancer. And it also has to do with property. 
So the Cashin Company, which is a uh, real estate brokerage, used the symbol for cancer because as in cancer, astrology, cancer rules the home and property and physical assets. <coughs> Remember we said that Freemasonry is the blue and red degrees? Right? The opening degrees of Freemasonry are called the red and the blue degrees. You'll see a lot of those symbols around. Here is the cancer symbol again. The yin yang. Yeah. <clears throat> but if you spell that word, it's an anagram for the word males. M A L E S, males. You couldn't have astrology without four cardinal points or four stars in the sky through which it becomes all possible. So you'll see a lot of corporate logos using this forester or four star motif. Whenever you see the word forester or these motifs, realize they're talking about astrology and the four cardinal points, the equinoxes and the solstices. You'll find uh, the Mars, the symbol of the planet Mars. Anyone in Aries knows their symbol is Mars. You'll find it on Volvo. Volvo is the Scandinavian t take on the Scandinavian word for vulva, which is the female opening. And Mars is the phallic symbol of the, of the arrow. Kron, K-R-O-N, it's a Bay Area television company, comes from Kronos, which means time. Arista, a word that doesn't mean anything in English, actually relates to uh, the constellation of Virgo. The most bright star in the sky is called Spica. But speak it used to be called Arista, so Arista Records that relates to Virgo, the sign of Virgo. One of the most important motifs in astrology is again the spring equinox, the rising of the sun at the vernal equinox of the spring every year. You're going to find so many logos that deal with that. The sign of Aries is the sign in which the sun, you know, rises on the spring equinox. That's in the sign of Aries. So you're going to find the motif of the sun rays or the Mazda symbol is the horns of Aries, the horns of the ram. Here is the sun. The Nissan symbol is red, a red sun crossing a border or a barrier half above, half below, right? A horizon line. And by the way, you know what the word Nissan means? It means the first month of the year. In Hebrew, Nisan means our first month of the year in their language. So this is the sun rising above the horizon. Morning stars, pretty obvious. Your most famous corporation franchise in America is nothing but the horns of Aries if you look at it. And that's why it's on a red background. The rising of the sun in the morning on the eastern horizon is exactly those colors, is it not? Right? Blazing yellow on the red sunlit background. That is an astrological motif relating to Aries, and if you know what Aries symbolizes, it represents power and aggression and dominance and will to power and libido and aggression and energy. Very powerful to use Aryan symbols in the corporate logos because it works. Here is the Hyatt Hotel. The word Hyatt is Persian, an Arabic word actually meaning serpent. And here you see what is called the gleam. You'll see the, what they call the gleam in advertising. It's a commonly used symbol. There's the pyramid. The raised two fingers is an ancient motif of the 33rd degree because when you raise two fingers, the segments are three degree three. One, two, three, one, two, three, the 33rd degree. And the Dodge Ram is clearly connected to Aries because there's the ram's head. And if you turn the word ram backwards, it's Mars, which is the ruler of the sign of Aries. We get the word arise from Aries. Because that's what the sun is doing in the sign of Aries. He's rising yeah, over the horizon. So we say, arise, good night. You know, the sun is arise and shine. Aries. The sun is one of the most pervasive of all symbols in this particular thesis. You'll see the symbol of the sun all over the place. You know what Mazda means? Mazda is not Hebrew. Mazda is Persian for the first month of the year. Nisan in Hebrew means April, the, the, um, March and April. Well, Mazda means exactly the same thing. It is the first month of the year when the sun rises on the spring equinox. And you'll see constant motifs of this, the sun rising, corporate logos that represent the sun. Jordan Maxwell was saying yesterday that the very word on means light. 
And you'll always see this word highlighted, just like it is here. So many logos use the word on or on, highly lit in some way or defined, and the symbol of the sun and the pyramid. Astrological symbols often appear in places you wouldn't find it. When the sun rises on the horizon and you see the lovers, that is from the sign of Gemini. That, by the way, even though it's hard to believe, is actually an astrological image that you're looking at. Relating to the twins, to the sign of Gemini, it's very, very innocuous, but it's all over the place, this kind of imagery. Here is what's called the sun window, or the solar window, with the ladder of Jacob going up. Solar windows are very, very important as is the phallic symbol. How many of your talk shows from Upper Winfrey onwards have used those sun windows? America's favorite videos, if you watch, look at the design, the set designs, the stage designs of a lot of the sitcoms and a lot of the talk shows. You'll find that they use the solar window motif an awful lot to represent the sun cult. Pyramids, the background of the night sky, that represents a house of the zodiac. That's what a window represents, the solar window. Not only is the sun important, but the word light is important in many contexts. Light is important philosophically. Light is also important subliminally. If it is light beer, then shouldn't it be L-I-T-E? But look at the choice of the very spelling. If you're drinking that, the implication is subliminally that you're drinking light. That's why it becomes addictive, because your unconscious mind would love to drink light. That's what we're all about, remember? Spiritual uplift. Well, they're going to hand it to you in this. That which takes you down, but it has on it, drink it, it's full of light. And what's the symbolism in the advertisements when the, the models are drinking? You'll see images of light and halos and all sorts of things to spiritualize things. Mountains are connected with spiritual ascent. So is light. But look who's using it and for what purpose. The human wreckage and debris of these poisons that have been uh, put into our, our life. Yes. Corona. Cronus, and many, many other symbols relating to, red, to Aries. Sears is an anagram for the word Aries. In the sure advertisements, the sun will, uh, in the advertisements, in the graphics, you'll see a beam of light come across. It'll move across the word. It'll suddenly glow on the R and move aside, right? If you ever watch their logos, they're interesting. Red Ken means the red king, which relates to the sign of Aries. Anybody in here Capricorn? One obvious uh, thing that I really have studied a long time is what they call positioning. It's another aspect of this. In our societies, they actually design the franchises to look like churches. Some of them, if you go into Taco Bell, if you go into Kentucky Fried, they have the turret. Kentucky Fried even has the little turret that we associate with religion. What burgers, french fries, and cokes have to do with spirituality, I don't know, but they think it does. Because, you see, they've taken us down into the appetite body. So, some of these banks even are designed that way. When you walk into some of these places, notice that they even have a portico. Some of them even have stained glass windows on the franchises. Next time you go, just take a look at some of these places, the Ben Franks, the Ringer Huts, and look at their design. That some of them are like Shinto temples, others are like Western temples. The seven up, we just talked about what the seven up are. What are the seven up? Are the seven lights in the sky? They're up there, seven up. Or the chakras. Play on words. Union 76 is, of course, Union 1776, when America was founded. But in 1776, May, uh, sorry, July 4th is in the sign of cancer. So America is born under the sign of cancer. That big golden ball that you see floating above uh, the um, stations, what is, it? what is the big ball that rotates in the sky that's all orange and gold? This is the sun, right? So they're already telling you there that this is the sun in Cancer, in Union 76. But masonry, people into masonry are very smart. They use a lot of codes and cryptic analogs. If you take the number 76 and put it on a clock face and know what you're doing, you'll find something interesting. 7 o'clock is actually 660, is it not? Right? Just think about it for a moment. Follow me. 659, 660. Plus the 6, and you have 666. I'm not stretching it. This is the way they work. 
words that don't mean anything in English. The word Pepe or Pepsa or Pepsi is a very, very old word. You've heard of uh, the devil, you've heard of Satan, right? Well, the oldest cultures in the world is the Egyptian. And if you go back about 25,000 years, the word that they have for the adversary, the word that they use for Satan is Pepsi. And they used to tell the children, if you don't watch out, Peppa will get you. Yeah, Apep or Pepsa will come and get you. The Egyptians. Yeah. Yeah, we'll come to Coca-Cola in a minute. It's so vulgar, I have to leave it to the end. <laughs> we were thinking of putting some barf bags under the chairs. I don't know if you got them. But you've got to find out who Sergeant Pepper really is and who Dr. Pepper really is. The symbol of Saturn, the Saturnalian cult that uh, Jordan Maxwell has exposed, also the symbols of, of Saturn. The Nike swoosh is the corner of the gleam of the planet Saturn because these people belong to ancient cults. And the, the concept of black that is used in Nike is important. Lots of symbols doubling up there as Saturnian symbols. I told you that they use mostly fire signs and earth signs, and that is true. But sometimes they will use the air signs when it works for them. And one of the most commonly used air signs is the sign of Aquarius. Anybody here in Aquarius? Well, they sometimes use your sign. And here is one that has been done very cleverly. Always when you see the circle, your eye only focuses on what's in the circle, and that's what they want to intend. In your mind, take away the circle and extend the lines, and you get what's called the wave, wavy line that is familiar with those who are Aquarians. And Aquarius is ruled by the planet Uranus, which represents freedom, you know, um, gender, and liberty, and the youth movement. Well, isn't that what Volkswagen's whole sales pitch was in the first place? Right. Viacom, if you look at their actual corporate logo, it arrives like a lightning flash. If you actually look at it on television, you'll see that the Viacom is like a wave of electricity. It is the sign of Aquarius that they're using, the media. We talked about the pyramid. It is another uh, you know, constantly pervasive symbol. All over you will find the symbol of the pyramid. There's so many of them. One could just do a whole lecture on just the symbol of the pyramid, the red and blue degrees there again. The missing capstone and the pentagram. Uh, some symbols like this, for instance, of the awards, the America. I find it interesting that the American Business Awards are using the pyramid. Oh, yeah. And you'll see a lot of this. I mean, obviously, you've seen images like this of the ascent to the sun and the sky and the background and the one, two, three, four, five, six, seven steps. Lots of symbolism there. You'll see things like this that your eye will not focus on until you, your higher mind sees the sun and the steps of the pyramid. Microsoft, start here at the bottom of the pyramid, go up. These people are interested in pyramids and technology. Here's beer, Keystone beer. Don't have to belabor the point because Jordan was pointing out yesterday what Keystone really means is the top of the pyramid. Here is the absolute using the pyramid, the sphere and the obelisk. This one intrigues me. It has the sun and the pyramid and the serpent made to look like water. Right? Beer. Who owns the beer? Who owns the alcohol companies? A whole study in itself. It goes back to the pirates, but it even goes back before that to who runs these poisons. Right? The tax exempt Knight Mal Knights of Malta and the Knights Templar, who were tax exempt, were the ones who opened the inns and the taverns and the bars, it's a whole interesting story and why those bars and taverns in England are called strange occult names like the green dragon and the horse and you know uh, the, uh, the white horse or the black horse and the rose and the crown. Ever wondered about those strange names? The plow and the stars and why they're called arms. Anybody gone into England you'll know that the taverns are called arms implying that it was a military order that opened them to poison the people of the world that go down there at five o'clock and sit there till twelve o'clock uh, complaining about the government and drinking their brains out, nothing gets done. That was the intention. 
the dissemination of poisons in our society, sugar, tobacco, alcohol, you, you name it, vaccinations, fluoride, is a study in itself. Possibly. Very interesting that. Yeah, we want to maybe look into that. Terminology. I love it. Words. That's how we have to start thinking. Symbol literacy. Look with the eyes of children again. The right brain. Don't let a thing slip by. And one of the great stories by Conan Doyle of Sherlock Holmes, when Sherlock Holmes was trying to talk about his technique to Dr. Watson, who couldn't get it, he said, I'll sum it up this way. He said, when you come to Baker Street to visit me, you come up the stairs every day. How many stairs are there, Watson? He goes, uh, I don't know. He goes, ah. You see, but you do not observe. That's all it's about. In the Bible it says, having eyes ye see not, having ears ye hear not. It's time to start watching them. Madonna, the Illuminati pyramid on her back. Camel, the Illuminati pyramids. And the man, see this? See the leg? You see how that's a human being? There's his face looking like this way. There's his chest and his arm. There's a human being there. Yeah. You have to, we, we could spend some time, but unfortunately we don't have it. We'll get a packet and look at it. And by the way, anybody here familiar with sacred geometry? The idea of the phi ratio and the golden section? Cigarette boxes are actually designed based on the golden rectangle. So just holding them has a therapeutic effect. Not in a good way, but in a negative way. That's one of the selling pitches they do. Not only there's opium in the tobacco and all of that. Yes, there's lots of things to create addiction. But these people are very adroit. Even the ratio of how the lid to the rest of the box and how it's opened and the, the, you know, the arousal that comes with that. Uh, but you can use the same techniques for your own healing. These are for your degradation. Go and measure your beds at home. If you have children, discover whether their beds are based on the phi ratio or not. Because these companies that make the, the beds for you and the, and, and the children's cots make sure that they're not based on sacred ratios so you have restless sleep. And so you, can't, you have nightmares. Chuck them out the window and do it right. Make your own beds, make them based on sacred geometry and watch what happens to your life patterns and your sleep patterns just from that one thing alone. <coughs> Courtney Pine, Illuminati symbolism. Who runs kinder care? Big question. Better find out. Look at their symbol. Oh yeah. Wonder why children go missing? I wonder about it. Swedish bank using the uh, eye in the pyramid. One of the most powerful ancient symbols of Freemasonry. One of their specific most sacred symbols to them. Right? The one they don't want to tell you about a lot is what's called the double uh, ashlar or the double cube. It's a well-known symbol to Freemasons. If you in your mind's eye look at this chevron symbol, a word that doesn't mean anything in English, you'll find that that is a cube. You see that in three dimensions? There's one cube sitting on another and it's red and blue like the red and blue degrees. Here it is again. The two cubes. The two cubes. The cube. Look out for this, the triple or the, the, the double cube. These chevrons, don't you find them also on the military as the chevrons? You ever wonder why those stripes were there? Corporal, uh, sorry, private corporal sergeant? No, first degree, second degree, or third degree Freemason. That's all it means. Anybody who served in those forces knows you can't get very far unless you want to start shaking some hands, right? The double cube and the world. What does that symbol mean otherwise? I mean, what, what is it? It's a cu double cube on its side. Yves Saint Laurent, double cube. Dodge Chrysler, double cube. Another one of the symbols that they uh, care about deeply and you should know about is what's called the red square. Why do we say we get caught up in red tape? Why do they cut the red tape, you know? Or, um, the red carpet. Look how many corporate logos use the red square just alone. And how many flags. 
Do you remember um, when, uh, I think it was Reagan, actually met Gorbachev for the first time, the first so-called meeting between East and West at Perestroika? The cameras didn't start rolling until the two of these people walked out into what was called Red Square in Moscow. And then when they were in the center of Red Square, then they turned and shook hands for the cameras. Interesting, that I thought. Right? It's in the center of Red Square. The center of the coronation of Queen of England is on a red carpet. Vatican center chair of St. Peter sits on a red carpet. The letter E is very important. We'll come to letters a little bit later on, but the, the letter I want to stress to you right now as in usage is the letter E. It's the fifth letter of our alphabet because in ancient occultism and even in modern occultism, E is very important because it represents the fifth essence or the quintessence. It was called epsilon. In Greek, the letter E is called epsilon and it represents a spiritual power of transcendence, the number five. So you will always find something in a corporate logo that will tweak the E for a reason. See that? It'll always be highlighted in some way, or separated in some way, or dropped in some way. Here you see the serpent of Intel? The serpent with the eye? Enron. Enron, yeah, good. I think I have one on Enron. Yeah, there you go. Right? It's either turned on, it'll be, it'll be highlighted or, you know, stylized in some way. Pyramids. The number five. So many groups use the five and the symbol of the sun. It's a big thing even in the techie world because these telecon silicon uh, types imagine that they're doing some occult work. The connection between the occult and the silicon valley is something I go into a lot in other talks. Look at the magical symbols. <coughs> opening doors into the intelligence, the technological world. The portal of the door is very important in Freemasonry. They talk about the porch. One thing that I find really pernicious in advertising is this simple, simply the degradation factor, the demeaning factor that the animals, how animals are used and how children are being portrayed. Not as children, of course. And how women are being portrayed. Here you have um, a symbol where the word coke, somebody was asking about the coke. It's an Egyptian word, and it relates to the male genitalia. Let's be polite about it. The ancient word for the male genitalia in Egyptian was coke, or K-U-K which is used as slang today, isn't it, for the male member? Right? It's an old Egyptian word. Look at the positioning of the model where she's holding it. Because they, you know, want to feminize things for men, but they want to phallicize things for women. She's got a missing head anyway, so she's got some problems. <laughs> so let's replace it, you know, with, with this, this surrogate phallus. That's why it's called the real thing. Here's another woman with some problems. She's got some head problems here. <sighs> this word is interesting. The company's name is, um, yeah, Ctex. Cetus is the Latin word for the uh, vagina. CTS. Often just in very innocuous shots like this, you'll find something weird about the posture, the limpness, the, 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 you know, the submissive, um, the simulating, uh, flaccid look of the female is used a lot, which in itself is pernicious. The fact that uh, there's something skewed about the imagery. Or they'll use the vamp. You know, a lot of this we know already, I'm just going over it. The idea of the tramp, the vamp. This is Salem. And uh, the incredible uh, vampiristic look of this is outrageous. And also the, the fact that it's, uh, there's dismemberment involved. And then we wonder why there's serial killers running the streets who are only too happy to tell you in court, I hear voices, I'm possessed, I can't help it, something's talking to me. Yeah, they've been telling you, why don't you listen? <clears throat> who are the guilty ones? Question of gender has been exploited greatly. 
wonderful sacred imagery of androgyny, which is the ultimate goal of all spirituality and all magic and all divination and all alchemy, is what we call androgyny. Not at a genital level, but at a spiritual level. The unification of the male and the female inside of you. That was the object of religion. That was the object of occultism originally. They don't want that. They want gender dysphoria now. They want to harden the masculine and weaken the feminine. So they play on these ancient mystical things. That's their job. They're not there to sell you products because they were millionaires in the first centuries of our period. In the early parts of this millennia, these people were already owning the world. That's only an ostensible concern to them. And that's where they get the money from. And that's why they advertise so heavily. They're into the cult of imagery, the cult of symbolism, to make sure that you are dis dis disassociated from your source and that your children are delinquent on the streets of the world. And that nature is subjugated. The androgyne, shown in symbols like this, or let's take a, a physical example where you've seen the guy shaving, the shaving ones where he's looking in the mirror. Very interesting how they use specular dynamics. You're looking through a mirror at a man who's shaving. Then the, the model, the female, comes up and looks in the mirror towards you together in an image like this. You're looking at your TV screen. That's a filter. The t the, the, no, you're looking through your eye is your first filter. <clears throat> Right? That's a lens. Then you look through the TV screen. Then there's the camera that's taking the photograph of the models. Then there's the mirror in the actual scene. All these what they call mirrors, specular dynamics, representing the filters of your own consciousness. All of this goes into making a single advertisement. And so the two bodies wrapped in one. You know? Or the strange mudras, the arms, the position of the arms, and the male and the female focusing in your mind. That can be done very beautifully. That can be done in great art, like in Jean Cocteau. Or the end of Francis Ford Coppola's Dracula movie where the two people arise into the dome you know, at the end as one being. That's a very spiritual rendition of that concept. But it can also be done to drag you down or to sell you some product based on a very high spiritual uh, motif that attracts your soul but is, it's toothpaste or something. So what? I love the art. I think the graphics are wonderful and I think that the people who do it are extremely skilled. They are the Michelangelo's and they are the Leonardo's of today. But they're not using their talents for the uplift of mankind. Unfortunately, they're, you know, they're taking it down. When you see the female model, the female, the goddess, the priestess, the empress, in the center of balloons or anything like this, balloons relate to the semen. Right? Balloons relate to the semen. So she is the ovum, the cauldron of all life, and the balloon motif, that's even why you set off fireworks in, at Christmas and fireworks at the new year. They represent the fire of the, of the male, you see, entering into the dome of the night sky. There's all of these ancient motifs. So the little balloons with the thread on them, right, in miniature are representing the male seed around the female. There's a sexual motif. Your unconscious mind perceives it as that. Ancient Motifs from the Bible, from religion, right? Which are gender oriented to sell you some damn apples or something. Eve and the apple, tempt, temptation. Oh, yes, and the wonderful advertisements that proliferate about, about, about what men want. Okay. Ch Chanel, four men. Here is the vesica, the opening of the female, and the C, the two C's of Chanel is 33. Right, the third letter of the alphabet, 33. There's a lot of symbolism in here. And the female opening. And A-N, by the way, right in the middle there, is the ancient word for the heavens, for the goddess of the heavens, An. Look at the positioning. Look at the positioning. That is very attractive to your unconscious mind, even her hands position. You'll find actors like Marlon Brando and um, James Dean used to use a lot of these kinds of symbolisms for positive usage. But just the symbol of the womb, anything connected to going back to the womb has a lot of currency in advertising. Yes, perfectly, good example. Um, Fila, let's look at this one and another twist on it. They use a lot of uh, words putting backwards. If you, the word fila doesn't mean anything in English, that should get your hackles up. As soon as you see something that doesn't mean something in English, please understand that it does mean something in one of the ancient languages of the ancient world. Latin, Greek, Hebrew, you know, which didn't use vowels, or one of the magical languages. If you spell the word backwards, you get aleph. Ah, anybody into Hebrew here? They'll recognize that word. Aleph means 
the life, the breath of life. Your breath was called Aleph. It's the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet. And it means breath or it means life to be alive. Now, you tell me what would happen. What does it mean if I take the word for life in Hebrew and turn it backwards? What am I suggesting? Precisely. So when you see our teens walking around looking like death warmed up with feel of t-shirts on and not feeling too good, maybe there's a reason. So you can wear the corporate logos, you can dress from head to toe and look dead chic. I don't mind, but at least know what you're wearing. That's all I'm advocating. Know what the symbols mean. Ultimately you shouldn't wear them, but you know, let's do it in stages, right? The yoni, the yoni, the ovum, the female symbols that are used constantly. Here's a company that even uses the term, the ovum, because they're selling you something more than what you think you're getting. The sacred and the profane. This is another area where, again, the spiritual, religious you know, motifs are being used in uh, different kinds of context, taken out of context and put into a materialistic context. The, the E, you see how the E is set aside there? Pretty self-evident. Um, yes. Don't think we need to continue you know, analyzing some of them. That word is naive. It's the anagram of the word naive because they want to associate water with purity and innocence. You see the uh, beautiful imagery of the sacred geometry, the vesica, the cauldron of all life, the lily of Mother Mary, the priestess, the lunar female, comes straight out of the tarot. All the symbols are there if you know what you're looking at. Some of the poses are meant to be erotic, but they're also um, sort of necromantic. And they're always ready to promise you things you don't have. Here's the sacred symbols of the three and the cancer. You see the cancer, the Lemniscate, the dove, and the Volkswagen saying, we give you peace, associations, peace of mind. You don't have it. You don't have it. But if you get their car, you'll, you'll have it, right? Slavery to time. Associations of the water. Very, very occult motifs. We're looking at paintings in the same way that the Renaissance artists used it, but for a very different context, different meaning. We talked about the sacred and profane. Just look at the mudras, right? That these designers come up with in order to spiritualize things. Because if you can spiritualize something, then your unconscious mind reads it as positive. You want it. And of course you want it. You want that light. You want that evolution. You want to go to God. Why not? So they know that. So they get in the way. Now, I don't need to be a Christian, but what is the definition of the adversary? What is the definition of Satanism, if not that? The impediment that gets between you and your God, you and your enlightenment, you and your spiritual development. Well, here it is. They're taking the very motifs that we have associated from our racial record that deal with our spiritual uplift that our forefathers used to worship that are encoded with thousands of years of our worship and our ardor and our spiritual associations and now they're using it for selling bars of soap and perfume and everything else. That is why it's so serious and that's why this needs to be gone into and understood for what it is. Androgyny. Spirituality. Egyptian symbols. Headless women. We'll come to a close by looking at uh, some more of the usage of, of, of letters. The mo of all the 26 letters, advertisers know that the most important letter is S because of its association with sex and success and serpents and the sound. It's the most subliminal, subliminal and hypnotic of all the letters. And you put S into anything, and your mind pays attention to it when it's on a product. And not just the letter S, but the wavy line, you know, the S, the serpentine shape, is used an awful lot as a going motif. Want to know why? 
Remember the Isuzu, the two S's? You always wonder probably why they've played on that particular, why they only use those letters to mess with and not the other ones, you know, for instance, if you pay attention. Well, here is from a wonderful ancient book uh, by Valentina Straton, and he gives the whole game away. He says here that the word S-U-S, or sun, the sun behind the sun, was once anciently written S-U-S, just like that. So again, remember, this is not new. He's saying this is not new. It is a symbol of the serpent force or super solar manifestation, meaning it's a solar symbol. The S-U-S denotes involution and evolution, the descent of the serpent force into matter and the return upward through evolution. The serpent solar disk is often seen on Egyptian monuments like that, S-O-S. Letters of the ancient alphabet were keys unlocking the originating causation and manifestation of all things. The S-S or Z-Z, same thing, symbolically used, which is what we're talking about, are interchangeable. Often the SS on sigils and talismans, and now we're talking about corporate logos, are suggestive of serpentine, evil influence, and denotes a sign of black magic upon others. 19th century authors, before corporations even were existed, before advertising was ever done. Now you find the same motifs turning up in our data space, in our living space. The letter X is another one of the great letters of power because it's the X and Y chromosome. When they want to sell something to a male, they'll feminize it. When they want to sell something to a woman, they have to masculinize it. So X marks the spot is how you feminize something for males. So you have the phallic bottle in the middle of the X, the chromosome of the female. The ovum and the X. The O is obvious because it's the female ovum and the X is the X chromosome. And just to highlight it, there she is. So just like you have these uh, semantic associations, and we went into a lot of uh, liminal subliminal, you can take a word. This is another little tool that they use because they want to work on your unconscious mind. Just as you can expand something, you can also contract something. You can take a word then you can shrink it down, as you know, into what's called a syllable. But when you have a syllable, it's kind of usual. You can often tell what the word is if you, if you see the syllable. They then take a syllable and shrink it down yet more into what is called the phoneme. It's a linguistic term, the phoneme. A phoneme, you cannot recognize anymore what it is. So it's a word shrunk down three, three times. And these are the phonemes that you then find on cars and different kinds of products all over the place. They mean things. XL, LX for light, it's Latin for lux. XI is for she, that's pronounced she in Greek and it means woman. XS is obviously XS. L is the ancient name of God. This is the male phallic. This is the word for knight. Right? This is the symbol of royalty. Status. When you get into the concept of the phonemes, you'll find that there's a lot of interesting things there. <coughs> you think I'm stretching it? They're happy to tell you what they're doing. Because here you have the car that's called the status, the Cadillac or whatever. It came to unco the status. And its phoneme is STS. Just like I'm saying, they use the phonemes to represent the concept that we're talking about. Two minutes? One. Okay. And then just to uh, finish off, we have to close now. PC, just that term PC. We talk about cetus representing the female opening, the phallic, I mean the ovum. And P is phallus. And that's where you get the word cities from. The cities were meant to be the symbols of the female in which we all live. Which is why they have the monuments and the obelisks inside of them which represent the, ma the male. So the word city actually comes from the word for the vagina or the opening of the female. So anyway, let me see. Yep. The male, this is the phoneme for the male member. I just want to end with my own personal reasons for um, being into this particular thesis. So that we're all on the same page as to why this is important. <coughs> NBC aired an investigation of Mattel and Disney just days before Christmas 1996. With the help of hidden cameras, the reporter showed that children in Indonesia and China were working in virtual slavery so that children in America can put frilly dresses on America's favorite dolls. 
In February 1999, a new report revealed that workers sewing Disney clothes in several Chinese factories were earning as little as 13.5 cents an hour and were being forced to put in hours of overtime. ABC's 2020 brought back footage of young women locked inside sweatshop factories sewing for Gap, for Tommy Hilfiger, and Polo Ralph Lauren. Naomi Klein says that all 50,000 workers at the Yu Yan factory in China would have to work for 19 years to earn what Nike spends on advertising in one year. Walmart's annual sales are worth 120 times more than Haiti's entire annual budget. Disney's CEO, Michael Eisner, earns 9,873 an hour, while the Haitian worker earns 28 cents an hour. It would take a Haitian worker 16 years to earn his hourly income. And the last one is it was Disney's annual meeting and about 10,000 shareholders, she says, crowded into the arena to rake Michael Eisner over the coals. They were upset that he had paid more than 100 million in a severance package to uh, the super agent Michael o Ovitz, who lasted only 14 scandal-wracked months at Disney as second in command. Eisner was further attacked for his own 400 million multi-year pay package, as well for stacking the board with friends and paid Disney consultants, and then for paying starvation wages to workers in overseas factories. We could go on. It sounds horrible, it is horrible, and it's taking place. These things that we buy into, that we don't vote with our dollars, that we do not take responsibility for what we're buying, and we are under this kind of oligarchical control, is enslaving the world. It is enslaving the planet, it is enslaving children, and it is not worth it. That is a particular reason why I am interested in this thesis. I want to thank you all for being here with us and for putting up with my tirade. You know? Lovely to see you all.